Uh, just for those of you who weren't here earlier, I'm Joan McNaughton. I'm chair of the climate group. The last session we heard uh, some uh, insights into focusing on the outcomes, on action, and the need to involve business. And we're continuing that theme with this session, uh, which is involving leaders from some household names globally. And the title is, We're Doing This, because a lot of businesses are. So it's my great pleasure to introduce and welcome to the stage your moderator, Andrew Shapiro, who's the founder of Broadscale, Jenny Bofinger Schuster, who works in sustainability for Siemens, Fleming Bessenbacher, representing the Carlsberg Foundation and the Carlsberg Group, but we haven't been promised any free samples. <laughs> Kathleen McLaughlin from Walmart. Fleming Voetman from the International Copper Association. And joining us during the conversation will be Dr. Mahmoud Khan, who's the Vice Chair and Chief Scientific Officer at PepsiCo, and if you made a guess that there were travel difficulties in New York today, you wouldn't be far wrong. But please join me in welcoming your panel. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's terrific to be here again with the Climate Group and so many of you from the Climate Week community and who are broadly working on creating a low-carbon future for our society. I'm Andrew Shapiro. I'm the founder and managing member of Broadscale Group. I've been working for nearly 20 years with big companies on sustainability and energy and environmental innovation. And it's always a pleasure at this time of year to get together and talk about where we are, what progress we've made. Uh, Broadscale is really dedicated to accelerating innovation in this space. And so we are eager to hear from a diverse array of companies. I think this is about as diverse a group as we could get. Uh, as we heard, we're going to hear from Siemens, so energy and industrials. Then we're going to talk about the world of beer. Uh, then the leading retailer in the world, Walmart. Uh, and then we're going to hear from the International Copper Association and finally from our friends at PepsiCo. Um, let me start by just making one observation. A year ago, we assembled here, uh, and we were in a position that was quite different than today. The Paris Accord had been agreed upon, including by the US, and the spirit of things was, OK, how do we actually get down to brass tacks and start accomplishing the goals of creating more sustainable, clean economies and businesses and industries? Uh, today, our theme is, we're doing it. And I like the whole tone of that, because we haven't taken our foot off the pedal at all. Uh, notwithstanding some of the confusion from the federal government in our country about where we are with regard to the Paris Agreement, business has not slowed down one bit. And we're going to hear the diverse ways in which industry leaders here are taking steps to decarbonize, to create cleaner, greener products, to engage their communities, and I look forward to the dialogue. So we're going to start with Jenny Boffinger-Schuster, who's going to give us some opening remarks from Siemens, uh, one of our sponsors. Good. Do you remember your first trip to Manhattan? When was it? Why did you go? How old were you? And how did you go? Did you take the train, the car, maybe the helicopter? I remember my first trip to Manhattan because it was so exciting. I was a young consultant and I had a project in New Jersey. And on my day off, I wanted to go visit Manhattan. And I actually took the ferry. And I remember that I was sitting in this, on this ferry. I was enjoying the sun, calming down. But honestly, I also remember the sound of the engine. So now, looking back, I ask myself, was that actually the most efficient and also the most CO2-friendly way of getting there? Maybe. Honestly, it's long ago. And in these days, I didn't care. And I didn't know. 
And that's the problem. We all didn't know, and we all didn't care. But today, we do know, and we do have to care. It's our joint responsibility to take action. And exactly at this stage, two years ago, we were actually the first larger industrial company announcing our carbon neutral program. And I was actually kind of brave because you have to consider we have around 300 manufacturing sites all around the globe. Our fleet consists of around 45,000 vehicles. So this is a challenge. But we took this challenge and we worked out four levers that are supporting us to achieve it. The first is our energy efficiency program. And with that, we are reducing the energy consumption at our sites. So for example, in Munich, we have a brand new headquarter. It's super modern, it's super exclusive. You should really go visit it in case that you're in Munich. And in this building, our building management system, it controls, for example, solar energy, geothermal energy, rainwater, daylight. And by doing so, we could reduce our primary energy consumption in comparison to our old building by 90%. That's a lot. Second, of course, we are using decentralized energy systems, and particularly with photovoltaic, we're achieving a lot. Third, yes, we do have a responsible company car policy. It's incentivizing efficient vehicles, and it's also focusing on e-cars. And with that, for example, in Germany, we could already reduce our CO2 emissions of the fleet by 30%. And then the last lever, and it's actually a pretty big one, is green energy. And for example, here in the US, 50% of our operations are already on green energy. <laughs> and so, if we look at what we have achieved in the last two years, we have already reduced our, our CO2 emissions by 20%. We will further do so, and in 2030, we will be carbon neutral. And in order to do that, we invest about 100 million euros. But the good news is, with the annual savings that we get, it is a positive business case. So already in year six, we have positive net savings. And I'm sharing this with you because I want to motivate you. We tried it out. It works. And exactly this motivation is actually the bigger lever that we have. Because, on the, on the other hand, we are helping our customers to improve their operations. And by offering them our environmental portfolio, they could reduce their CO2 emissions by 500 million tons. That's 10 times the emissions of New York. 10 times New York. And this portfolio ranges from energy production through transmission to the efficient use of energy in buildings, in manufacturing, or in transportation. And this portfolio also brings additional values. It is, of course, resilient, it's safe, and secure. And the key to all this is our innovation and our technology along electrification, automation, and digitalization. Because in order to decarbonize, we have to work on all three. And if we look, for example, in electrification, we have an e-ferry running in Norway. We are pioneers when it comes to e-aircraft. We have the first e-planes up in the air. For example, in Paris, we have installed driverless metros. These systems are fully automated. And by doing so, you can actually increase your efficiency by up to 50%. And of course, we have to digitalize. Because the more intelligence we put into all these systems, the more efficient they will be. So let's take all this and bring it back to the city. 
Can you go bond back, please? Let's bring all that back to the city. Because if we want to win the battle against climate change, we have to win it in the city. And if we look, for example, to New York, we have installed a microgrid in Co-op City. Co-op City is the home of around 60,000 inhabitants. And this microgrid is not only more efficient, it's also more resilient. And so if you, for example, remember the storm Sandy, there were a lot of outages all around the city, but not in Co-op City. And if we now look into the future, the challenge for the city will even increase. There will be more people, there are energy demands, and we need to get down on our CO2 emissions. So if we now look into the city, and if we imagine that we have all these smart systems out there, we have microgrids, we have a smart grid, we have fully automated buildings, we have CHPs, we connect CHPs, we have e-cars, we have them in the grid. Let's imagine if we have all these systems, but what if you don't speak to each other? If the one dot does not know what the other dot is doing, they have to speak. We have to connect these dots. And for this, we are developing a platform. We call it MindSphere. It's open so that everyone can participate, and it's in the cloud. And at the end, with that, our vision is to have an operating system for a city that is managing all that. So if then, in 2030, that's actually when my two boys will be 15 and 16 years old, if they travel to Manhattan, maybe it's their first time to Manhattan. They don't have to care anymore because they will be automatically guided to the most efficient, the most comfortable, and also the most CO2-friendly way of getting there. And maybe they even fly electrical. Maybe. <laughs> this is the vision we are working on. And I can tell you this is super exciting. And now we click through all this. <laughs> And it's not only exciting, but I'm really proud that we not only commit to those innovations, but that we only commit, that we also commit to responsibility. Thank you. We're going to hear now from Fleming Bessenbacher from Carlsberg. It's really great to be here today and really sense this progress we are making here today. And uh, I'm representing Carlsberg here, and Carlsberg is, of course, a being company. We have had the purpose for 170 years, active brewing for a better world today and tomorrow. And we have actually had sustainability in our agenda also more or less for 170 years. And actually in June, in June we allowed, launched a new sustainability program, which is called, as you can see up here, Together Towards Zero. And that means zero carbon footprint, zero water waste, zero irresponsible drinking, and zero accident at our um, breweries. And we're doing this because we firmly believe this is the right thing to do, both from a business point of view, but also we would like to help to create a better and more sustainable world. Let me here today concentrate on the zero carbon footprint here and briefly. We would like to have ambitious goal here, and this is just not very small incremental improvements here. We are really setting the target very, very high, not only for ourselves, but actually for the brewing industry in general. So we have now the ambition that in 2030, we should have zero carbon emission at our breweries. And actually also, this what we call be at hand out of the different consumers, we should actually have a 30% reduction in our carbon footprint. In order to have this very ambitious goal in 2030, we also decided actually to put goals already in 2022, just to make sure that we are on the right track here. We are doing this here on a science-based target here. So we engage with Carbon Trust, which is an independent, non-for-profit expert, to analyze the full carbon value chain for our breweries. And therefore, we came up with these very ambitious goals here, and we would actually now like to follow these goals here, measure how far we are going here, 
And as you can see there, in 2022, we have 50% reduction in carbon emission at our breweries and 15% reduction in the beer in hand carbon footprint here. It is not simple, but we have actually set these ambitious goals here. So no carbon here, no coal at our breweries here. And again, we have breweries around the world here, and we have to find out what's the best at the different breweries. And of course, I cannot explain that all in detail here, let me just take one example here. In China, at our brewery in Dali here, we have now introduced 8,000 solar panels here, just as one example which I can fit into this ambitious goal here. We will also, in 2022, have 100% renewable electricity. As you know, coming from Denmark, we are very far ahead of this reducing the carbon footprint here. And in Denmark, in general, our electricity, 32% of that is actually coming from wind farms. And therefore, we actually would like to be inspired by that, also acted to engage with consumers. Because I think this is the other very important thing here is that we should also like to engage with our consumers, communicate what we're doing here. And therefore, at the Carlsberg Brew site here, we actually created a zero carbon sustainability bar here. It's run by a bike here, you're on a windmill, and that windmill is then producing electricity through a draft master system here. Of course, this, you can say, it's also to create fun, having this discussion with our consumers, how can we actually together go this very ambitious goal here. And if you come to Copenhagen, please come and sit at the Zero Carbon Sustainability Bar and enjoy a Carlsberg here. <laughs> we should also like to say that uh, Carlsberg uh, is quite unique. Uh, back in 1876, our founder donated his brewery to a foundation uh, the Carlsberg Foundation, and the Carlsberg Foundation is still today the main shareholder of Carlsberg, with having around 30% of our shares there. And therefore, today, I have this dual responsibility on one hand being the chairman of the Carlsberg Brewing Company, but also being the chairman of the Carlsberg Foundation. And actually, just today, we are actually announcing that we will actually invest 80 million US dollars here in impact investment, in active carbon reduction, water conservation, and sustainable food production here. And of course, we're doing that from the, carbon, from, from, the, uh, from the foundation because we believe it's a good investment here, good return, but it also means that this good return we're getting from this investment would actually be further invested back into our business and into the foundation. So let me just say again that I believe Carlsberg has set very ambitious goals here, and we are really and want to be committed to brewing for a better world today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> You know, Amory Lovins famously said that most people don't care where their energy comes from as long as they have hot showers and cold beer. Now we know that that beer should be low carbon as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Jenny Fleming, thank you for your opening remarks. I'm going to turn to our other panelists for their first comments, and then we're going to get some questions and dialogue going. Kathleen, you are leading one of the most ambitious sustainability programs that there is at Walmart, given Walmart's scope and size. What is happening at Walmart that excites you in terms of the progress that's been made? You guys have been at this, I know, since 2005, really, mm -hmm. when Lee Scott first launched your initiative. So what's at the cutting edge for Walmart yeah. now? Yeah, that's right, we are. Our goal is to make consumption sustainable. So you can imagine there is a long list of environmental and social issues we're working on. Uh, climate is uh, one of the issues at the top of the list. And we've been at it since 2005, and we've made some progress, but we're really excited about something we launched uh, just in, in the spring uh, that we call Project Gigaton. So uh, before launching that, we had made good progress. We have doubled our fleet efficiency. We have achieved 26% renewable uh, energy sources globally. Um, we had one project that we had set out to remove 20 million metric tons from our supply chains, and we actually ended up north of 40 million. And that gave us confidence that we could be much more ambitious. Uh, and that effort included things like consumer product innovation with suppliers around things like cold water wash, um, laundry compaction, LED light bulbs, those kinds of things. It included agricultural optimization, uh, fertilizer optimization, and field practices to reduce emissions, also animal ag. Uh, it included packaging reductions, waste reductions, and so on. So looking at that, we said, you know, let's think bigger, especially as Paris uh, was coming to a close last year. So um, we announced in November of last year that we wanted to get to 
50% renewable energy sources globally by 2025 as a leap forward, and that we wanted um, to be the first retailer to take on science-based targets, which we've done. So scope one, scope two, uh, we're on a glide path that'll have us reducing our total emissions by 18% by 2025. But importantly, we said, okay, well, what about scope three? That's where the lion's share of the emissions is. And I'm sure you know, folks in this audience know the stats. 60% of emissions globally are in consumer goods chains. 60%. And it's a huge amount of deforestation and water withdrawals and all kinds of other issues too. So we said, let's create a platform for scope three for all Walmart suppliers globally. Well, all Walmart suppliers globally end up being suppliers to pretty much most consumption globally. We're in 28 countries. Um, you know, we're doing this in China. We're doing this in Canada. We're doing this in the US, in Mexico. So we launched in April something called Project Gigaton. So we did the math with folks uh, at the UN and CDP and WWF and so on and worked out that if we could have science-based reductions in our scope three alone, that would be about a gigaton of emissions reduction. Over what time frame is that? Um, that's by 2050. Okay. So we set out to say, all right, let's look at making this practical. So earlier we heard from the governors about, you know, we need the policy framework, we need the call to action, and we absolutely do. That's... Um, the signal that we need to kind of entice people and keep people moving. But the question is, how do we make this operational? How do we actually help people do this work? And so that's what Gigaton is about. So we have um, tools and resources available for our suppliers that are signing on to this in a number of areas. So agriculture, so row crops, as well as animal ag. Um, we're working on a number of projects, in fact, with, with um, Pepsi as one of the, the companies we're working with in the field, in the Midwest, in the United States, for example, around row crop optimization. Fertilizer, for example, um, can be as much as 25% of the cost of row crops. So there, there's a huge business case around tackling this as well as uh, for climate. Um, energy, so renewable energy and energy efficiency, so tools and practices and resources to help people accelerate their own work in, in that area. Packaging reduction, packaging can sometimes be 20% of the cost of a product, of, of cost of goods sold, so again, clear cost optimization case around reducing that, it's just waste. Uh, consumer product innovation, we'd love to see the next version of LED light bulbs and cold water wash and laundry compaction and all these kinds of things that help consumers make more sustainable choices. Um, waste reduction, especially food waste reduction, which is a huge generator of emissions. And then lastly, deforestation, where we have been certainly working for quite some time in many of our suppliers as well on things like palm oil, Brazilian beef, um, beef in general, soy, um, as, and pulp and paper as real drivers of deforestation. So um, one of the things I'm most excited about in this platform is the business case. It makes perfect sense um, for consumer goods companies to focus on this for a couple of reasons. Number one, our customers actually care. So in terms of building trust uh, in us as consumer serving companies, that's important. And then the cost benefits of doing this work um, and so we're helping our suppliers make that case for their own companies, their own stakeholders, and, and you know, the goal is to accelerate. It's also critical that we have collective action, and it's one of the reasons we were so disappointed by the decision of the federal government in the U.S. to pull out of Paris. This takes collective action, the innovation, um, the efforts. <clears throat> It really is pre-competitive whole system change that we need to drive. So we are trying to do our part in continuing to send a market signal uh, in the absence of, of other signals that this is really important. So we're excited about it, and I would ask all of you in this room, I, I imagine this is a bit, you know, preaching to the choir today. You all have broad networks, though, that include other companies that uh, may or may not be as engaged on this issue. Send them to us. We want to enroll them. We want to support them. Uh, and really help accelerate progress. Uh, and, and it turns out that if we actually go well beyond Walmart's scope three gigaton and consider all retailers and mm. all consumption globally, that's 60% of emissions. We can make enormous progress just through collective action in the business community in these areas. Thank you. And that's a theme I want to actually invite all of you to address, which is individual company actions versus mm. your whole sector. Right. And I know you were, we were talking about 
working in retail prior yeah. to getting into Walmart. So philosophically, are you okay if Amazon, yes. Target, other no, guys absolutely. hop on board with in this? In fact, yes. And in fact, we've done some analysis. You know, Walmart, we're going through a big transformation now in our own business around um, e-commerce. Mm -hmm. And we're an omni-channel player. We have a huge store network, but we have a massive e-commerce business, and it's quite, you know, integrated. So we actually engaged some people to help us understand emissions profile end-to-end. E-commerce pure play versus bricks-and-mortar retail pure play versus an omni proposition. And probably not surprising to people in this room, omni is the best in terms of optimizing for convenience and flexibility, but lowering the aggregate footprint because e-commerce on its own is problematic from an emissions mm -hmm. point of view. You've got extra packaging, you've got last mile emissions, that if you fully factor in scope three, it's a challenge. So yes, we would love Amazon to join this and we'd love all the other retailers and, and consumer facing companies uh, to work with us. It's gonna take collective action to, to really make the progress we need on, on this issue. Great. And speaking of collective action, Fleming Votman's here from the International Copper Association, a trade group. I'd like to hear from you. Also, Dr. Khan is here from Pepsi. You may want to come up and see us because you're going to be next. <laughs> Great partners. Uh, Fleming, what is the Copper Association doing? What are your members thinking about a low carbon future and the role of copper in that uh, future? Sure. Absolutely. So, I mean, mankind have used copper for more than 5,000 years. and we don't have to go a lot of blocks south of here to go down to Pearl Street where Thomas Edison rolled out the first electricity grid. And of course, uh, ever since Thomas Edison, copper has been the key conductor of electricity as well as, as heating and cooling. And so we might have been around for a long time, but we're more sort of uh, relevant than ever. Uh, McKinsey did a study recently showing that the demand for copper will go up 40 something percent in the future because of the low carbon transitioning. So for us, low carbon is a good business, and we're heavily invested into that. Um, we're also pretty optimistic, not just from the business point of view, but also, of course, in terms of what we're here to talk about in terms of combating global warming. Um, I think it's, we're in a pretty unique time where we have all the policies. We have almost consensus among the countries across the globe that this is what we want to do. There's three countries who don't want to be part of it, but, but overall close to consensus. But maybe more importantly, we have all the technologies we need. So if we look out on Manhattan, since how it's developed since Thomas Edison, I think it's fair to say we had 150 really good years. We had a good run. But we also probably need to admit that we are extremely inefficient in the way we use uh, electricity and energy and all. So if we could just retrofit Manhattan with state-of-the-art technology from Siemens, uh, with Lightning from, from Philips and others, right? We would have come a long way if we would do that retrofit of Manhattan, and the same we could easily do that with the cars, with existing technology. So we have the policies, we have the existing technologies. So what we need to ask ourselves is, why don't we do it, right? Because the thing, of course, with, with, with global warming and climate change is, of course, that that's, that's a race against the clock. Right? We have an issue with speed. It's not that we can say, yeah, hallelujah, we're doing good, we have all the products and whatever and so on. But it's a race against the clock, so we really, really need to speed up. And I think that takes also a break with conventional thinking around how we do business. We can't be organized the way the world was organized at Thomas Edison's time. So we need to do it differently. Two short examples. One of the things that we work on is a program together with UN Environment called United for Efficiency, where we basically take all the countries in Southeast Asia and in Latin America and say, why don't we agree on energy efficiency standards for this region? Why would every country, every city want to reinvent the wheel we don't have time for that. Reinventing the wheel is not very efficient, but also we don't have the privilege to have time to do it, right? So let's take the best standards globally for energy efficiency. Let's roll them out to Southeast Asia, et cetera, et cetera. That in itself, with existing technology, would save us one billion tons of CO2 every year. Mm -hmm. That just makes a lot of sense, yeah. so we need to do that. Mm -hmm. Another thing, in Hamburg, the world's largest recycler uh, of copper and one of the world's largest copper producers, Arub, is there in the center of Hamburg city. They've been there for 150 years, 150 years. You use heat around more than 1,000 degrees. What do you do with the surplus heat today? And what have we done for 150 years? We send it out to chimney. Does that make sense? It makes no sense. So finally, we come to realize that that surplus heat, why don't we use that to heat the homes of Hamburg? 
Of course, that all of a sudden means we need to rethink the business model and how we organize in a city, as we also heard from Siemens and Siemens and others, and Mayor Bloomberg had pioneered that. So that's where we kind of need to not just retrofit and rewire how we organize ourselves, but we also need to rethink how we work together in a city and so on. I mean, the opportunities there are enormous, but that's how we need to challenge ourselves. We need to get up to speed and we need to rethink also how we do business there. Uh, Great. So that would be my opening remarks. Thank Thanks. you. And I want to talk too. then, you, you referenced the point about different regional standards and I want to hear from all of you about the developing economies and how we can help them to leapfrog to, to new technologies that are lower carbon. Uh, Mahmoud Khan from PepsiCo, uh, Vice Chairman and Chief Scientific Officer, thank you for being with us. Glad you were able to make it with the traffic. Uh, your industry, the food and beverage industry, has a number of challenges when it comes to sustainability. The challenge around obesity, the challenge around you know, operations. Where does climate fit into your priorities as a company globally as you're engaging with stakeholders? Well, if we think about greenhouse gas emissions and we think about water, both critical to climate, the number one contributor is the food and beverage and agriculture industry. If you look at that end-to-end Probably about three quarters of the world's fresh water is used by in the production or manu you know, growing and producing food, directly or indirectly. Somewhere around 70% of greenhouse gases, depending on how you look at it, is coming for. So it, we globally cannot touch that challenge around the environment and climate without addressing agriculture and food and beverage industry. Everything else is relatively small. So I think what you just heard from Walmart is an example of how different components of this industry need to come together and are coming together, right? I'll just elaborate a little bit more on the Midwest row crop initiative. The challenge is the runoff from the Mississippi and down into the Delta and the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. And quoted, what, about the size of the state of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. The challenge is there, the problem is in the upper Midwest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yet, for lots of reasons, we haven't been able to bring the different stakeholders and players together until the private sector got involved. And now the private sector gets involved, Walmart, PepsiCo, General Mills, Cargill, all different players in this end-to-end -end supply chain. Now when we put our collective energy together, we can start to address and have started that initiative, bringing the farming community together. It's probably going to need engineering challenges too because we're going to have to change the way in which we think about drainage, uh, irrigation, fertilizers. But any one sector can't do it. With, if we don't do it, we continue expanding this dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, which actually not only is an environmental issue, it's affecting livelihoods. Think about the fishing and marine industry along that whole coastline. Let me touch on another example that we've taken on. We know that if we think about our scope three uh, impact from greenhouse gas, which is 90% sure. of the impact. So if we touch, as we've done traditionally in our industry, scope one and two, great, we celebrate. We cut it down by 20%, 30%. We cut 20 or 30% of a 20% pie. That's 4 or 5% of the globe. That's not going to move the needle right. until we take on scope three. So we looked at this about five years ago and said, look, is it practical? How do we do this? And then we kicked off an initiative we call the Sustainable Farming Initiative. We said, if we take everything we know how to do today, so no more new inventions, take everything that's already been invented and implement it, and we identified farms in this example in the southeast of England, our potato farms, and we set one of those moonshot goals. And we said, if we implemented everything we know in terms of water efficiency and greenhouse gas production, and said, set a goal that within five years will reduce water use and greenhouse gas production by 50% within five years, can we do it? We rolled it out, we worked with the farmers, Farmers wanted to do this with us, looked at this end to end, and by the end of first, sorry, by the end of first quarter 2017, we actually achieved that 50% impact hmm. without diminishing yield. That's the key. The farmer needs to actually still have a livelihood. Right. And so my point of taking that example now as we roll out SFI across about 70% of our global supply chain, what it shows you is. This is not about inventing new things today. The idea of spending more R&D to find new tools isn't 
the only thing. The majority of the impact is take what we know how to do today and have the courage and the collaboration to implement it. And if we do that, we actually can change the trajectory. At the end of the day, from my perspective and our perspective, this is not a political statement. Let's put that aside. This is simple math. And it's a simple survival of our industry because we're going to feed another billion and a half to two billion people and we don't change our practices as has been said over and over again. We don't have an alternative. The issue really is do we have the courage to take what we know how to do and actually implement it? Which also means break barriers between the different sectors, mm -hmm. collaborate across our industry yep. and bring the different players together. And I Great. think the example you heard from both of us is a perfect example of we're not customer and client. We're not competing to CPG. Bring them together. This is the one key space where competition has got to be left outside the door. Mm -hmm. we, it's for the collective good. That's the only way we are actually going to grow an industry. Mm -hmm. And growth there is. There's going to be a billion and a half more people to feed. Mm -hmm. How are Great. we going to do it? Great points. Yep. Go ahead. Oops. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Um, two, two other examples of existing technologies in emerging markets being yeah. applied. So one is China where we've been working for a few years now on something we call factory energy efficiency. Uh, we partnered with McKinsey. They had a ready platform, which is um, a tool that factories can use to reduce their energy consumption. So great for the factories. It promotes energy efficiency, big reduction in emissions. We got 70% of the factories that Walmart sources from across China enrolled. Um, and we're, we're announcing that this year. We want, now want to extend it across a much broader uh, supply chain in China. And these are existing technologies, yeah. not rocket science. Second example is deforestation, where uh, WRI created a beautiful tool that has wonderful maps down to you know, the field level um, showing deforested areas. We took that, married it with Walmart Brazil data about farms that people were sourcing from for the Walmart chain in Brazil and married those together and created a tool that our buyers are now using when they're um, sourcing beef to verify across 75,000 farms that they're not coming from deforested areas. And that's a tool we're now collaborating with them, with Google, with WEF, to, Global Forest Watch tool to make it available to everybody. We want everyone to use yeah. that tool. So existing technologies helps us move faster, needs to be pre-competitive, we need to drive adoption. So again, please spread the word and get people to join in these efforts. What and I hope we come to this because the smallholder farmer in emerging markets, we have to bring these technologies mm -hmm. to their level. Right. Otherwise, it's in, if it's inaccessible, it doesn't matter if it exists. So I hope we get to that conversation. <clears throat> That's where we've got to have the Good, impact. good. The other component of it that I want to touch on is I mean, there's consensus here that business should do this. You should collaborate, even work with your competitors. What about the investors? Do they get it? Because sometimes you have business leaders saying this is good for business and the institutional investors remain skeptical. Sure. I th absolutely, I think they get it. And I think that's breaking with the conventional wisdom and how we organize ourselves. If you take one of the largest copper mines in Chile today, they run 80% now on solar, which is funded by an investment fund and a pension fund. Because the pension fund, of course, is looking for yields in a you know, zero interest environment. At the same time, the mine has to, all kind of money is competing for other projects. So here you can come in at a mine site, you can operate a solar panel, you have a long term agreement on that. So I think there's a lot of these opportunities out there. Again, it just, we need to sort of connect the dots between those good business cases and then bring in sort of some of those investors there. Let Absolutely. me bring it back to Jenny. Do you, do you feel the, investor community understands it in your sector. And the other piece is, it might be easy for Walmart and Pepsi to say we can compete with, or we, excuse me, we can collaborate. Do you have the same spirit in the industrial and energy sector? Are you going to work hand in hand with Defin your biggest competitors? Well, definitely. And I mean, this is also how business in general is changing. And it's again, also digitalization is bringing the change that we do have to think more in ecosystems, that we have to open up. And also, I'm coming back to our platform, I'm opening something up that's really new, that's a change. And I think that's how it works, and that's how we have to treat the, the climate battle, because it's a joint responsibility. We will not be able to win at Sony. Two positive examples of the investor you know, community coming to this. So um, FSB, uh, a year and a bit ago, launched the Climate Risk Task Force. Mm -hmm. um, 
to look at climate disclosures and create some standards for companies to do a better job of describing their governance practices and disclose what they're doing around climate and make that easily available to investors. Uh, and that just came out a couple months ago. Um, Bloomberg actually chaired that task force and a number mm -hmm. of folks participated. And I think that's really helpful to try to create some standards around how to do this. SASB would be another example, the Sustainable Sustainability Accounting Standards Board to create a common framework for measuring and reporting on things that are relevant to investors in the financial community. Uh, we need a lot more of that. I'd still, what I would describe as the Wild West in terms of metrics and measurements, and a lot of this is hard. Um, so, and also, I, I still sense a bit of schizophrenia in the investor community where in the same institution, you'll have a team that's actually the one making decisions about investments, and they're not really paying attention to, to some of this. And then other teams that are the ESG teams that are doing right. analysis based on somewhat faulty metrics, and then they don't connect. So ways to go, but people are working on it, and that gives me hope. And Fleming, you have the benefit of uh, the fact that your, your controlling shareholders are owned by a foundation, which is a truly remarkable thing. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, you mentioned this point in your talk about we have to make this fun for the consumer, and I think consumer <laughs> engagement is yeah. really important, because I think uh, when people are shopping at Walmart or traveling on a Siemens train, they may not be thinking about these issues. How do you think we accomplish that? You're a nanoscientist, so maybe you can bring some <laughs> scientific uh, well, notions I, of how we influence behavior I think, first of all, I think it's very important to have this partnership, because this is mm -hmm. partnership between businesses, with government, but also with the consumers. And I mm -hmm. see more and more when I travel around in the world that I, consumers is also getting more and more engaged in this year. I was recently heading a committee, uh, an advisory board to the Danish government on circular economy where you reuse, recycle, mm -hmm. resync, and uh, reuse. And, uh, you know, I, I see more and more sharing cars. Uh, I think more and more that mm -hmm. the consumers today is actually seeing that there's a need to do this here. And, you know, I mean, as was said over here, I mean, it's not something radical new things. I mean, take some of the low-hanging fruits and just do it and get it out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is going to be incredibly important. But I see more and more, especially young people, actually stepping up and say, we want to change things. Yep. So it matters for hiring. It matters exactly. for stakeholders. Yep. Um, Mehmet, I'm curious, do you, are your consumers giving you feedback that they want? Yeah. Cleaner, Look, greener operations obviously we're a consumer products. company. We, this is central to what we think about every day. First of all, the consumer is far better informed than they ever were. My children and grandchildren are driving more about what I consume and what we consume in our, in our household than we ever did the other way around. And so I think we're seeing a lot more of this reverse generational mm -hmm. influence mm -hmm. than we're used to as boomers. The millennials and that generation are going to drive this. But you mentioned about the bottom line. At the end of the day, as the consumer mind shift occurs, as the cost of doing business includes the use of inputs that we traditionally didn't measure, water isn't free. The impact of packaging on the environment isn't for free. As all of that comes together, the cost of doing business is impacted. We either get ahead of it or we end up in a situation where we don't have the runway to be able to do it. And society is going to demand of this. At the end of the day, we call this performance with purpose at PepsiCo. It's still about performance. We're still performing as a business. Now, the question is, are you thinking about the next 30 days? Or are you thinking about the next one year, two year, or five years? Whichever time horizon you're really interested in will start to determine how much you really are interested in this. You can get through the next 30 days. Long -term no problem. Thinking. Speaking of timing, we're running out. I'm going to ask each of you for a 30-second closing thought uh, with the following lens. Is there a major innovation that's happening in your business or your sector that's coming down the line that we may not know about that is either going to happen or you would like to see happen? There are so many. <laughs> that's a tricky question for us. But I believe similar to what we saw with renewable energies in the last 10 years, I personally believe the next big technology is everything around transportation, how we move around in a city and beyond. I think this will tremendously change, and that will tremendously change the lives of all of us. Thank you. I think Fleming. it's very important to have science-based goals here. So we can actually measure things, and the fact that big data and so forth means that for many different businesses, we have data which actually can be used actually to make predictions for the future. 
So I think I big data is going to be a big, big thing in many different ways. Glad we got that in there. Thank you. Well, al yeah, along those lines, uh, machine learning on those big data sets, so the application of AI to every facet of uh, business practice, and that's going to help us accelerate food waste reduction, hyperspectral imaging of products coming through the DC. You can predict this strawberry will spoil faster than that one, just through that machine learning. So that's going to transform everything. Yeah, I think one of the, the, the big innovations will be a phase out of any energy inefficient technologies. And that will only come once we sort of more systematically think about life cycle and circular thinking overall. I think that will really drive it and then connect that with technology and the financial communities. I think that will drive a lot of change. I'd say the two components and they're interrelated. One is we've gone from, we've had an era of scale with inefficiency and imprecise methods to much greater precision, which then gives us targeted efficiency, food waste, runoff of nitrogen, inefficient use of water, whatever, okay? The second is we're evolving from an era of understanding and applying chemistry to understanding the biology and the ecosystem, the environment with which we live in. And through that, we can harness organisms, microbes, plants, the diversity of our flora to bring back the diversity with which we as humans evolved that we sort of left behind. We went to uniform narrow and yet we're discovering there was probably a reason nature gives us this diversity not only in what we consume but how we interact in the environment from the microbe to the fully developed. That is going to be an exciting era as that science comes to fall. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Biomimicry, big data, AI, that's a lot of cool stuff. Future of mobility. Please join me in thanking this terrific panel.